Today we're here with Stephen Chise, president of North Cities Healthcare. How did you get started in this profession? Well, um, when I was uh, a teenager, my dad was a building contractor and he was building nursing homes. And I was working as a carpenter's helper and then when we'd open a building, I'd help set it up. So that was kind of my early exposure to it. And I had no interest whatsoever in going into any type of senior care business at that point in time. Um, I ended up uh, in community college uh, majoring in uh, card playing and girl watching and uh, doing very well in both, I might add. Uh, and my grades were not the best. And it ended up uh, being uh, in the draft. Uh, we were number seven that year in the draft and they took 41 at my. So I spent uh, two years in the Army and uh, came out of the Army motivated uh, to complete college. So I took the GI Bill, I went to the University of Minnesota and um, started taking classes in uh, long-term care at that point uh, because there was an interest in that point. And I had uh, met a couple of college professors that um, got me interested in it. So um, I uh, ended up uh, graduating with an undergraduate degree in human geography of all things, which is uh, kind of like the study of how we impact our environment as individuals. Uh, it's about demographics, it's about urban planning, so if you substitute those for ge human geography, that's kind of what it was. But it was the only major that was close to what I wanted to do at that point in time. So um, at that point, my dad had uh, two nursing homes that he owned, and um, I was gonna go to grad school, but he convinced me to come to work for him. So uh, I started uh, operating one of the buildings. I liked it, uh, it was enjoyable. Uh, I went back to grad school on a part-time basis. And um, at that point in time, there was a program in uh, long-term care on a graduate level. So we started that program there. Uh, and it's, it's the anniversary of it is actually 50 years ago uh, that the program started. So um, that's how I got started into it. And, uh, got involved in the, the state association and uh, eventually the national association and um, kind of went from there. Wonderful. You're involved being a co-chair of Vision 2025. Tell us about that initiative. Well, Vision 2025 is a collaboration between eight national trade associations and organizations. AHC NCAL is one of our founding members, uh, but it also is the other seven uh, senior care organizations and anytime you can get eight organizations together talking about an issue uh, it must be have some significance and the significance is how do we attract and how do we develop new senior care leaders uh, to help um, care for people in the future. The designation of 2025 is really a, a play on the fact that the first boomers are going to turn to age 80 in 2026 and we need to be getting ready for those individuals at this point in time. So between 2025 and 2030, uh, we see about a 30% a, a de increased demand for uh, senior care leaders that we're gonna need going forward. So uh, the, the effort with Vision 2025 started out with a uh, symposium three years ago based on a sabbatical that Doug Olson did and said, we need to do something, folks, and we need to do something collaboratively. Uh, one group or one organization can't do it. So we approached uh, the organizations we brought together. We're on our third symposium. It'll happen next month in June. And uh, we'll bring about 130 to 140 people together from academia, from providers and associations to start talking about what we need to do to develop senior care leaders for 2025 and beyond. Wow. What impact does this standardized academic training have on senior care leaders? Are there specific outcomes that you envision? Well, interesting, um, if you take a look at uh, college accreditations, and I'm involved with several colleges right now, uh, the, the accreditation process really doesn't focus on senior care. Uh, there's a, a healthcare administration curriculum that's well developed. So one of the desired outcomes that we want to move forward to is to be able to train senior care leaders in the six categories of senior care. Obviously skilled nursing, which we're interested in, it's assisted living, which are the obvious ones, but home care, hospice, daycare, adult daycare, 
and senior living in general. And you take a look at those six categories across the board, uh, about 80% of the knowledge and skills they need are all the same across those six categories. And then you get into the 20% where maybe home care has got special regulations or hospice does. But what we want to develop is, is these relationships between providers and academics to develop the curriculums so that we can qualify individuals in those six categories. One of the goals of Vision 2025 is to have 25 university programs focused on senior care administration geographically spread across the country by the year 2025. Yep, Can you give great. us an update? Sure. So uh, when we take a look at all the thousands of universities across the country, there's about 200 of them that say they're doing something with geriatrics. And, you know, it's, it's everything from hospitality and geriatrics to clinical geriatrics. Uh, when you narrow that down, there's probably 50 colleges and universities that are actually focused on senior care administration of some kind. Uh, but when you get down to it, there's only a handful of schools that really are focused on it. Uh, NAB, the National Association of Boards of Examiners, they've accredited about 15 schools on the nursing home and assisted living side. But uh, there's no accreditation for home care, daycare, hospice, or senior living at this point. Bits and pieces out there, but, but nothing that's a specific curriculum. So as part of our effort going forward, will be to work with providers, associations, and the academics to develop these curriculums that are gonna give uh, individuals the skills and the knowledge to be highly effective senior care leaders in 2025 and beyond. So who should get involved? And what do you recommend as the first step in getting involved? Well, I, you know, we're at a point now where we're acknowledging where the problems are. And so what we're saying to providers and to saying to academics, look at you need to partner up. You need to figure out what the needs of our sector are at that point in time. So for provider standpoint, find out who in your geographic area is doing with something with geriatrics or senior care and talk to them about what your needs are and what your organization needs are. From the academic standpoint, they want to be able to say to students, hey, when you graduate, you'll get a job. And here are the organizations we're working with. We need sites for internships uh, and not just regular internships. We'd like to see paid internships. One of our other goals is a thousand paid internships across the country. That is a way that we can attract uh, a high quality student, but they're also going to attract uh, a whole wide diverse student body from different walks of life. One of the barriers that we have in getting into senior care is having to get an internship. And if you have to go six months uh, for free work, it doesn't always work from a standpoint of financially from that standpoint. So that's the second criteria that we're looking at is trying to get paid internships out there. And then uh, we wanna see sponsorships and scholarships with the uh, provider community. Uh, and also things like uh, providing speakers and adjunct uh, faculty members. Those are all things that academics need from that standpoint. What I, what I tell people is that the academic world is quite frankly no different than the business world. They want to see a return on their investment. And they want to know that students are going to come in, that they'll pay tuition, but the students are going to be successful and they're going to get the jobs going forward. So this is this collaborative relationship between the providers and the academics are going to help us attain uh, the senior care leaders uh, that we need going forward. What a fascinating program. Yeah, uh, it's, it's been an interesting journey. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful how you've taken such a large issue that's mm -hmm. facing the industry and really broken it down into action. Mm -hmm. Here yes. are the exact pieces that we need to do. It's really so fascinating. In my, my graduate degree program at the University of Minnesota, they have a class called problem solving and they call mm -hmm. it the Hamilton method of problem solving. Uh, and now they call it the Minnesota method of problem solving. <laughs> but it's, it's a, it's a nine-month uh, course that you take and you go through the intricacies of how you solve problems. That's probably one of the key skills that I learned that has helped contribute to my career over the over that the number of years I've been involved is try, to try to do problem solving and try to understand it. And the biggest thing you learn in problem solving is number one is what is the problem you're trying to solve. And that's oftentimes most difficult because what, oftentimes what happens with leaders 
is somebody comes to them and says, the cook didn't show up today. And so right away we go into uh, solution mode, mm -hmm. which is wrong. You want to go into diagnostic mode. So it's diagnose first, prescribe next. And so if you don't know what the problem is, the problem can elude you. And I tell, people, I tell my students, because I teach, um, that if your car isn't running, and you think the only reason it's not running is you didn't put gas in it, that might be the reason, but you've got to diagnose first. It could be that your battery's dead, your catalytic converter's missing. I mean, there's <laughs> 50 different reasons why your car isn't running. So you need to diagnose first, then you prescribe. Think about it in medical terms. If you go in uh, to see a physician and the physician says, just by walking in the room, I can tell what you need. And here's three prescriptions that you need to take. If you're seeing that physician and you don't walk out immediately, you know, you don't know what's going on. They need to ask questions, they need to analyze, they need data. And from a problem solving standpoint, that's the same area. So when we took a look at, at Vision 2025 and tried to figure out what exactly we need to do going forward, we tried to figure out what were the barriers of why we can't accomplish this. So uh, we need to have relationships between providers and academics. If they don't know each other, if they don't know what's going on with each other, we can't move forward. We know scholarships are important. We know that these paid internships are important. We know that a sustainable program is important. We believe that it takes 20 to 25 students on an annual basis to make these programs sustainable. And then finally, we need individuals that are getting behind this and supporting this. A hundred years ago at the University of Minnesota, the providers got together and raised a million dollars to fund a chair in long-term care. And, and that was back in the 80s. And if people told us you'd never be able to raise a million dollars out of long-term care because they'll never do it. And we did it in a nine month period of time. And that chair is still there and it's still functioning and it's, it's actually the, uh, the endowment, it has grown to $7 million at that point in time. So it can be done if we work together collaboratively as providers and academics. Collaboration, it's mm -hmm. just so critical. Absolutely. Well, I look forward to hearing more as we get closer to 2025, well, thank you. Come, come to Chicago in June and you could hear <laughs> 130 people talk about how the collective vision is gonna make this successful. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for your time, yeah, Steve. No I appreciate Happy it. To do it.